In this video, we'll dig a little deeper into the metrics we use for evaluation. That is, the numbers that we assign to our models to indicate their performance. We'll look at both regression and classification, and we'll start with regression. The loss function we've seen already is that of the mean squared errors, the squared difference between our predicted value and the real value averaged over the entire data set. One thing to note here is that if you use mean squared error loss, the value that you may want to report is the square root of the mean squared error loss. This is difficult to use as a loss function because it makes the gradient more difficult to work out, but when it comes to interpreting the performance of a model, it can help to apply this square. This is easiest to see if your target label comes with a unit. For instance, in the past lectures, we were predicting the height of somebody's leg in centimeters. In that case, the residuals are also a value in centimeters, how many centimeters we are off, but their square is a value in squared centimeters, which means that the MSE is a value in squared centimeters as well. Therefore, if we take the square root of the MSE, we come back to a value in centimeters, which makes the error of the model easier to interpret in terms of the original units. The performance of a regression model can be decomposed into two factors, bias and variance. This is not something we can easily measure, but it is something that can help us understand in which ways our model is performing well and in which ways it's performing poorly. Imagine that you've trained a model and you've measured its MSE loss. Somewhere between that and zero, there is an optimal value of mean squared error. That's the ideal value that any model might be able to achieve on this data set. And if we were to repeat the whole experiment again, so if we were to resample the data from the same source, retrain our model, we would get a different MSE. That's not usually something we can do because we usually only have one data set. Let's imagine that we can. We might see a distribution of mean squared errors appear along this axis like this. These are sort of the values that we would get in alternative universes where the data is sampled from the same source but with a different outcome. The mean of all these values we can call the true mean squared error. This is essentially the value that we're estimating, averaged over all possible data sets that the source of our data can produce. We get an expected value of the mean squared error and that's this value here indicated by the vertical bar. This is not a value we can compute, but it's a value that we estimate by sampling our data set and then training a model and measuring the error on that model. Now, the difference between the optimal MSE and the true MSE is what we call the bias. These are all the errors introduced by the limitations of our model. On top of that, there are some errors introduced by the randomness inherent in sampling the data. This is what we call the variance. And finally, there is some irreducible error. There are some aspects of the regression task that are simply random noise, and not even an ideal model can predict these. This is what we call the irreducible error. Putting all this together, the MSE that we observe consists of three components, the bias, the variance, and the irreducible error. Note that for a single measured value of the mean squared error, we cannot tell how much of it is down to bias and how much of it is down to variance. We have to guess this based either on resampling of the data or on contextual clues. But what we can say in general is what different values of bias and variance look like. If we have both low bias and low variance, then the mean squared error is not very dependent on specifically which data set we've sampled, and it's very close to the optimum. This is the ideal, and if this is the case, then we don't need to worry. But if our error is higher than this, it's either down to high bias, high variance, or both. If we have low bias but high variance, then on average, our model is doing very well, but it's very susceptible to small changes in the data, which create high variance in the resulting MSE. So if we're lucky, we might end up all the way on the left, and if we're unlucky, we end up all the way on the right. Note that it's not that lucky to end up far to the left, because that's likely a model that generalizes poorly, and if we sample another data set, and for the next data set we apply to this model, our MSE might end up all the way to the right again. If we have the opposite, high bias and low variance, we end up with this picture, where the specifics of the data set don't affect our performance very much, but the model is simply not well suited to the data, and we get a high error. One analogy that is often used to explain bias and variance is that of throwing darts at a dartboard. Having low bias and low variance means that you can consistently hit the bullseye with every dart. Having high variance means that you cannot and your throws are spread out, but on average, they cluster around the bullseye, 
and having high bias means that your throws are very consistent and very close together, but that point is very far away from the bullseye. Often, bias and variance make a trade-off in machine learning. Models with high bias tend to be the ones that don't fit the generating distribution very well. This happens, for instance, when you try to apply a linear model to a nonlinear dataset. The model class simply isn't powerful enough to represent the relations that are there in the data. This is also called underfitting. Models with high variance are those with enough flexibility to capture all the details in the data, which make them prone to overfitting. And overfitting means that you are sensitive to random fluctuations, which gives you this high variance that we saw in the mean squared error. To make this trade-off, we need to reduce the bias if we suspect that our model has high bias, and reduce the variance if we suspect that the model has high variance. Reducing bias can be done by increasing model capacity, increasing the number of features you use, or carefully combining different features that you already have. This is something that we'll look at in the next lecture. Reducing variance is essentially the same as reducing overfitting, and this can be achieved by reducing your model capacity, adding regularization, which we'll talk about in later lecture, or in specific cases, tuning parameters like the maximum depth of the trees that you're considering. In many models, like K and N regression, there is a hyperparameter that specifically allows you to make this trade-off. In this case, we can increase K to increase the bias and decrease the variance. On the left, we see that for small values of K, the model is very sensitive to the noise in the data and fits the training data almost exactly. And we see that as we increase K, we get closer and closer to the predictions we would get from a linear model. In lecture 10, we'll pick this subject up again, and we look at how to combine different models, both to reduce the variance and to reduce the bias. For now, let's move on to classification. There's a lot to be said about evaluating classification, but in this video and the next, we'll focus on these topics. Class imbalance, the confusion matrix, and metrics like the true positive rate, the true negative rate, the precision, and the recall. But we'll start with a question you should ask yourself if you achieve a low error. Is the error that I observe good? If it's close to zero, then it's at least not bad, but it's often difficult to establish whether it's any good for the task you have in mind. So imagine that somebody tells you about a machine learning pr project they're doing, and they proudly state that they get a classification error on their validation set of 0.05. 5% of their examples are misclassified. Should you be impressed? To illustrate, let's look at, the recurring let's look at a recurring discussion in the Dutch media. Should all women over 50 be screened for breast cancer? This is essentially a classification problem. The instances are people, and the target label is has cancer or has no cancer. If 1% of patients have cancer, then an error of 0.05 is not very impressive. We can do much better by creating a classifier that simply says that nobody has cancer. This is an important thing to realize. The amount of imbalance between the classes, how many positive versus negative examples you have, has a big effect on how impressive a particular error is. So the next time you see a headline like this, your first question should be, what was the class distribution in the training data? If 90% of the cases in the training data are acquittals, this is not a very impressive result. As it happens, in this case, the classes were rebalanced to 50-50, so 80% so is at least notable. However, now we have a classifier based on artificially balanced data. In a production environment, whatever that means here, the classes are likely not balanced 50-50, so this specific classifier will be of no further use. So when we want to know whether an error of 5% is good, it depends, and it depends on two things specifically. First, what we've already discussed, the class imbalance. How much more likely is a positive example than a negative example? But there is also cost imbalance. How much worse is a mislabeled positive example than a mislabeled negative example? In the example of breast cancer detection, there are two types of misclassification. Diagnosing a healthy person with cancer and diagnosing a person with cancer as healthy. Both come with a cost, but not the same cost. Another example is spam classification. Both misclassifications should be avoided, but having a genuine email land in your spam directory is much worse than having to delete a spam email from your inbox. Here is a pretty imbalanced data set, although still not as imbalanced as the breast cancer problem. It looks pretty difficult. So what would be a good performance on this task? One way to gauge that is to measure the performance of baselines. And the most important baseline you can include is the majority class classifier, the classifier that assigns all instances the class that is most prevalent in your data. In the example of breast cancer, 
this would be the classifier that classifies all patients as not having cancer. This is what we call a baseline, a model that is not necessarily in itself useful, but that is useful to compare the performance of our model to. In this case, the majority class baseline tells us that if we're using error as a performance metric, the only error values that we're really interested in are those between 0 and 0 0.05. Here is another way that class imbalance can screw things up for you. In the previous video, we noted that it's important to have a large test set. And if you ignore class imbalance, you may think that with a thousand instances, you have a reasonable size of test set. However, in this case, we have high class imbalance. So if we start with 10,000 instances, split off a test set of 1,000 instances, then we end up in that test set with just 50 instances of the minority class. Practically, your final evaluation, despite the fact that you have 1,000 instances in your test set, will just be a question of how many of these 50 positives you actually detect. This means you can really only have 50 levels of accuracy that you can distinguish between. You can make a bigger test set, of course, and you probably should, but that leads to problems in your training data. Since you're essentially building a detector for positives, it doesn't help if you can only give it 100 examples of what a positive looks like. In the next lecture, we'll look at some tricks we can use to boost performance on such imbalanced training data. Our second concern was cost imbalance. The second thing we need to consider when interpreting errors is cost imbalance. In all these cases, one misclassification one way costs much more than a misclassification the other way but both cost something. The simplest way to deal with cost imbalance is to assign a cost to every type of misclassification and instead of minimizing the total number of misclassifications, minimize the expected cost. If you're lucky, both types of misclassification have the same unit and then this is an easy process. If the units are not the same, for instance, money saved versus life saved, making such a choice can seem very unethical. On the other hand, any classifier you decide to employ will make this kind of choice. Even if you decide not to use machine learning, the alternative, like a doctor using their own judgment, is also a classifier with its own implicit cost balance. Cost imbalance is particularly important when we consider matters of social impact. If we predict a person's sex from their physical appearance perfectly, and we use that as a prediction for their gender, we will have about a 99% accuracy. However, the 1% we then misclassify is precisely that part of the population for which gender is a sensitive attribute. Just because our classifier has high accuracy doesn't mean it can do no harm, in a large part because the mistakes it makes are not uniformly distributed. In this case, they are in fact focused squarely on the vulnerable part of the population. One way of getting more insight into the way our classifier behaves under class imbalance and under cost imbalance is to look at different performance metrics. And we'll discuss in this video the confusion matrix, the precision and the recall, the true positive rate and the false positive rate. And in the next video, we'll look at the topics of ROC plots, coverage matrices and area under the curve metrics. Given a binary classifier and a data set, a confusion matrix is simply a small two by two matrix of all the possible ways uh, the classifier can get the answer right or wrong. For instance, for this classifier and this data set shown here, we see that the classifier correctly classifies five red points. Uh, these are true negatives, points that actually belong to the negative class and are predicted to the negative class. And these end up in the bottom right corner of the confusion matrix. Likewise, there are six true positives points that are actually in the positive class and that are predicted as positives. These end up in the top left-hand corner. And these 11 points are the points that the classifier classifies correctly. It also makes three mistakes. One blue point, a positive, that is classified as a negative. We call that a false negative. And two red points, negatives, that are classified as positives. We call those false positives. And if we sum up the values in the confusion matrix by row and by column, we see what the class balance is in the actual labels and what the class balance is in the predicted labels. In this case, both are pretty balanced. But if we have a data set with class imbalance, then we can read that off quite clearly in the margins. And what we see here is a classifier that has decided to predict that everything is positive. From the true positives, false positives, false negatives, and true negatives, we can compute a number of valuable metrics that can help us identify where a classifier is having problems. First, the precision and the recall. The precision is calculated as the true positives divided by the total number of predicted positives 
that is how many of the positives that we predicted were actually positives. And the recall, also known as the true positive rate, is calculated as the total number of true positives divided by the number of positives in the data. That is, out of the positives that were actually in the data, how many did we identify? And whenever I have trouble keeping straight exactly which is precision and which is recall, I look up this handy diagram from Wikipedia. There are many more metrics that can be computed from the confusion matrix. Wikipedia provides a helpful table in case you ever come across them. For most purposes, for most purposes, precision, recall, and accuracy are sufficient. Note that some of these metrics, like recall, go by a lot of different names, like true positive rate, sensitivity, probability of detection, and power. So now that we have some more metrics, the question is which data set do we use to compute them on? So let's say with the accuracy, for example. When we compute, say, the accuracy on the test set, we talk about the test accuracy. This is computed only once at the very end of our project to show that our conclusions are true. When we compute the accuracy on the validation set, we call it validation accuracy. We compute this to help us choose good hyperparameters. And predictably, when we compute it on the training data, we call it training accuracy. Now remember that in the first lecture, I said emphatically that you should never judge your model on how it performs on the training set. Why then would you ever want to compute the training accuracy or any other metrics on the training data? The reason to do this is to get a sense of the generalization error. The difference between your validation error and your training error will tell you whether or not your model is overfitting. Here, for instance, we see a plot that you might produce for a decision tree classifier, where you set a maximum tree size, and then you plot the training accuracy and the validation accuracy against this maxim maximum tree size. We see that if we set the maximum tree size very small and we don't allow very complicated models, that the training accuracy follows the validation accuracy very closely, but neither are very high. As we increase the allowed size of the tree, the accuracy increases as well. But at some point, the training accuracy keeps climbing and the validation accuracy stalls or even decreases. This is the point where the model starts overfitting. And the gap between the, between the validation accuracy and the training accuracy is what we call the generalization gap. And we've shown it here as an example for maximum tree size, but you can put any other hyperparameter on the horizontal axis and compute the same kind of plot to see if it tells you something about the generalization error in your model. In the next video, we'll move beyond single metrics of performance for your model and we'll look at specific types of curves you can draw to get some insight into how your model performs, especially under class imbalance.